my name is James Davis. I've been employed with the Johnson for 41, going on 42 years. But my first encounter with the president was back in, nine, when I first went to work for him, which was the 22nd of, of uh, September in 1959. Ms. Johnson came out and interviewed me, me and my wife, and we got a notice that we had been accepted as employees for the, for the Johnson. Well, Mr. Johnson, I didn't see him until later on, and when he came to the ranch, it was hunting season. So that morning I got up and I was instructed to, to get his guns and get him some hot coffee ready, and et cetera. So I did, and the first thing, at that time, he's a majority leader. The first thing he said to me that morning, he said, James, is, uh, I had on a, a coat that looked very expensive, Naga heart or something like that. Anyway, he said, James, that's a nice looking coat you got on. After I put all it, put his gun in the car and his coffee and so forth. And I said, yes, sir, thank you. Well, I, things started running through my mind. That ain't what he really wants to know. So the next day he says, James, he said, sure is a nice looking coat you got on. I said, yes. So the third day he said, James, how much you pay for that coat? And I can remember till this day, it was $12.95, and I got it from Sears. But, you know, it was new, and it looked expensive. So, okay, that was one of the first things. But I was, uh, while I was alerted to his attitudes and how to get along with him, by a guy by the name of Gene William, which, Helen William, which they were there before I was. He said, James says, his bark is better than his bite. And he gave me some pointers how to stay out of trouble and don't say the wrong thing. I, and that, that hunt season uh, later on, uh, he, that week he didn't take me, uh, none of the rest of the, the help to help him harvest the deer, but later on, we had to go with him, and when him and George Mo his friend was George Mosin, and we'd go and get with George Mosin, and the senator, they'd kill several deers, and we would, you know, cut them and take them to the locker plant. Well, that Christmas, uh, at that time, the president did not have any grandkids, so what he normally would do would in, invite all the help kids to the house to celebrate Christmas. That went on for a time every Christmas that he would have. I didn't have any kids at that time but he'd have kids from the help to come in and celebrate Christmas. And what I liked about him is that Senator respected everybody and suspected everybody was intelligent. And anybody that he would invite to the ranch, regardless to the caliber, he'd bring them through the kitchen and introduce them to every member of his staff. And uh, some of them, uh, later on down the line, I'll tell you some of the favorite and some of the favorite that I, one of the favorites I didn't like, I'll put it that way. But, um, and all my time with Johnson, I learned to respect him because he would, uh, he had someone that he had respect to fix, or know how to get everything fixed and keep the ranch running smoothly. He had a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Lawrence Klein, which was the maintenance person. Uh, I understand he's still around. He retired for a long time ago. But anyway, between me and Mr. The Klein, he had a, a battery of cars, about eight or nine cars that sat around that 
uh, he wanted, kept running it. Anytime he come come in from anywhere to get one of those cars, he expected to run it, and run it to crank up and run. And if it didn't, somebody's gonna be brought on the carpet. And the first person he meet, that's the person he get read the right act to. And between, I'd slip and try to keep the car. If Mr. Klein wasn't around, I would every once in a while crank the cars up, see that one. If the president come, that uh, I mean, well, not president, but he was a senator at that time, come, that uh, none of us would get the right act. We wouldn't get our brought up on the carpet. And that worked pretty good for all of us. And he, he had a ranch farm. At that time when I come to the ranch, he had an old man working, I forget his last name. Uh, uh, but anyway, short, shortly after I was working for him, they employed a young man, his name was Henry Blackburn. And me and Henry, and we got along all right, and uh, Henry was responsible for the, the, the taking care of cattle, seeing that they was, you know, vaccinated and, and uh, brand at that time. Occasionally, during the winter months, I would help the, the, the ranch hand because it was slow. The Johnson was in Washington, and there wasn't much to do in the garden around the house. Incidentally, I was when I hit the ground there. I was given the responsibility of, of taking care of the vegetable garden, which I was familiar with because I was born and raised in the country, and we had gardens, and I was familiar with that. But taking care of the garden, well, I would take care of the garden, and seeing that during the year that. Uh, it was irrigated and and that we kept the grass and everything out of it and uh, harvested when the time for the vegetables were ready to be put up. We was me and my family and the adopted kids would pick the beans and harvest the corn and put it in a deep freeze. He, he, he liked black-eyed peas and he loved corn. So that uh, I would make sure that every year we'd have a good corn crop and a good black-eyed pea uh, a crop. And uh, then later on, he, a senator, he got to be vice president, and we all know the story about that. And then uh, he assigned me to when he was vice president. He decided he'd run for president, and it, they assigned me to one of the planes as the stewards on the plane. So we flew all over the United States, and and uh, I goofed one time. Uh, we was in Dakota, North Dakota, someplace, and I left his pillow. And uh, well, you, that's a long story on that. I won't go into that, but. Uh, 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 during the campaign, we would stay up all night, and then the plane would take him back to Washington, and then the plane would come back to Texas. The plane was stationed here in Austin. Um, but anyway, uh, after we got that finished with, I'm kind of going at random here, but. Uh, I love the pre at that time. Uh, I keep saying the president because the last of all of what I'm going to say is about the presidency. He was a fellow that that respected everybody, as I said in the beginning, for being intelligent. And if you wasn't smart enough, you you he he you get to go to school because he get to tell you about these you know <laughs> and. Um, he kept you, if you had a brain, you'd use it working for Lyndon Johnson because that's what he required of you. He was good at uh, having people, good people around him. If they wasn't good, they'd get good to do the things he wanted, did 
to maintain his livelihood and his style of living. Uh, and he also talked politics with all of us. He was, and uh, when he was president, he once told us how he appointed Thurgood Marshall. He had won to appoint black, but he'd had to first appoint one to solicit general so that when it come up before Congress, they wouldn't say he wasn't qualified to be uh, uh, serve on uh, as a Supreme Court justice. And he would explain to us how how our politics went, and he'd always given us all a hard time about buying stuff on credit. Several times, myself and a guy at that time named Jackie Weed, he'd have us to bring all our bills to him, and he'd pay them and give us a rat. I say, now don't go around here charging these people, take advantage of it. Well, <laughs> I could say he was taking care of us, but I mean, you know, Sometimes things you need, you couldn't pay cash for it, so we had to charge. So I remember the second time, he said, y'all owe anybody anything? Well, you, you wouldn't nobody lie to him because he had a way of knowing that you find out anyway. So we said, yes, I said, oh, $2,000. He got, had me to bring it, bring the bills, and he paid it. And said, don't, I don't want to have you charging anything. So. I was very skeptical of Charlie because he furnished his car, gas, and place to live. Live right there in, the, in in the big house. At that time, he had two rooms set aside for uh, the staff for the house to to stay there. And that way, it went on for a long time until he this when he got to be president. Then he needed those two rooms, you know, to extended gas. So then the ranch foreman, he had built a ranch foreman house, a new one, up on the hill. Well, the ranch foreman, they moved, and then I moved into the house where the ranch foreman house we used to stay. I understand now they tore the house down. But uh, I find working for the, for the, pre for the president, were one of the greatest experiences I've ever had, and I have nothing but praise to say for the man because he didn't not, uh, uh, he treated all his employees, according to my observation, uh, the same. Now, and the later on, he had wanted me to come to Washington to, uh, when he got, when he was vice president at this time. so. I went up to Washington and threatened, and it was intended to move up there. But uh, the couple that they employed to take my place uh, wasn't taking care of the ranch. So I was only in Washington six months before I got shipped back to Texas to take care of the ranch. But uh, in the meantime, in the six months, he had. Uh, his secretaries, uh, they're going to teach me and Gene Williams how to, to type uh, uh, in the office, because we was in the office all the time for, you know, running errands and, and, and we was kind of a mail cat, you know, take care of mail. Anyway, he had me and Gene and the secretaries, the secretaries was trying to teach us how to type. Now, how in the world are we going to type and do all the rest of this stuff? Well, before I could, could get my hand on the typing, in the six months I was back in Texas in my routine taking care of the ranch. And uh, I remember one time uh, he had left something on, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the name of uh, of this person, because it's um, Wes, yeah. He had a friend by the name Wesley West, which is a very good friend. And a lot of time, Mr. West, would, his plane would, was accommodating and taking the Johnson different places. Anyway, one day, something left on the plane, and, and the plane didn't take off. He said, James, go out there and 
stopped that plane and, <laughs> and whatever it was, I forgot now what it was. But then I, I went out and 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 uh, the plane was was on the run, taxi and all. But anyway, he stopped and I gave him a problem that the president wanted something he wanted off that plane. And I often wondered how he really figured that everybody could do what he asked him to do. And if his air condition wasn't working, he said, James, go in there and fix that air condition. Well, I didn't know how to fix no air condition. But he learned you how, if it was something that simple that you could adjust, you'd, you'd, you'd learn how to do it right away. I'd call a client, and Mr. Klein client come out and take care of the situation. But he were, uh, I consider, one of the best person I ever worked for him, because, worked for because he really, uh, respect everybody's intelligence. And some of the things that he hold in confidence and tell them how he had to do to get bills passed in Congress was fascinating. I know uh, we as blacks always discuss that uh, I met President Kennedy and I liked him, but uh, we all said that President Kennedy would never be able to get the civil rights bill passed because he did not know enough uh, stuff on people in the Congress to to fo to to get them to accommodate him by pa by uh, voting on the bill. But anyway, uh, the president told me, he said, "Look, say I'm gonna get this civil rights bill passed, but I'm gonna have I'm gonna lose a lot of friends." And he say the country might go Republican, the South might go Republican. And he told me that, and I know one of his best friends, a senator from uh, Georgia. What is his name? Uh, Russell. Russell. That he used to come to the ranch all the time and hunt. Hunt season, Senator Russell would come to the, to the ranch and hunt. Well, after that civil rights bill passed, I've never saw Senator Russell from that day to this. I this day, but I have his wife. We his wife used to come to the ranch afterwards, but we, I never did see Senator Russell. And like he said, he he lost a lot of friends when he persisted on getting that civil right to be a bad. And the bad thing about uh, he really suffered during this. Uh, this war, not the Korean War, the Vietnam, Vietnam War. He that was one of the hardest pills I think that uh, I've seen him dealing with, or uh, trying, uh, because he he got some good advice and bad advice, and but anyway, we all know the whole story that uh, it caused him to to decide not to run for president anymore, which was. Uh, I really regretted that he didn't, because shortly after that he didn't. Uh, uh, but in the meantime, I had my wife was pregnant, and he said, "James, say if it's a boy, you name him Lennon. So I'll give him a care." Well, it wasn't a boy; it was his girls. I name a Lennon, he still give her a care. So. And uh, we had several, we had cows, I had a few cows from this calf uh, up until I got hurt about 11 years ago when Ms. Johnson decided to move to Wesley. Uh, I was, she redid, was doing the house and all the, the, the old does and winters, I was taking them back and forth to the ranch one Saturday. I was en route to uh, the house to pick up some stuff, take to the ranch, and a young couple run, run into me and told them a truck, and I didn't know I was hurt. I had a head injury. I didn't know I was hurt until about a week later. I started talking to Shred and, and, and uh, wobbling, and, and one morning I woke up, my head was hurting so bad, I didn't know what to do. My wife took me to the doctor. And 
The doctor wouldn't let me go home. They put me in the hospital right away. I hit my head against the cab of the car. They hit me from the side. And my head had hit the side of the truck. And uh, my brain had, was swelling, had swole. So right away they had to take me and operate on. And I'm, surpri I'm, I'm surprised I did it as well as I did after that operation. Because once they get to messing with your brain, you, you never know whether you're going to uh, be whole again or not. But so far, I'm, I don't retain things as well as I used to. But so far, I'm, 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 I'm doing okay from that accident. But anyway, uh, from that accident on, Ms. Johnson decided that there uh, was no use of me going back and forth to the ranch. So since then, for the last 10, 12 years, I've been just taking care of her at West Lake. Go out there every morning, work, and uh, she decided, well, oh, four, four days, four hours a day should be enough for me to, to maintain and, her and, and make a living. So that's what I've been doing. Yeah. Tell us about Mrs. Johnson. Well, Ms. Ms. Johnson, uh, I learned early on when Ms. Johnson were a person that would put you on observation and uh, after about four or five years, she said, well, he's one of the gang. And we can deal with it. She would like, the president, when you put, walk on the premises, you his man, you get to doing the things that need to be done. But Ms. Johnson would observe you and uh, watch you closely. And if you uh, prove in four or five years that uh, you could pass the grade within yeah, smooth sailing, smooth sailing from then on, and we've been in, I've been there for 41 years, and and I consider her one of my with my best friend, and she seems to think that I'm a friend, but uh, uh, she uh, uh, got into the wildflower business and and. She had everybody that worked for the Johnson mixed up in it for a long time. But after I got hurt, well, then I, don't, I didn't, you know, go out and help her with the wildflower situation. What about uh, LBJ's sense of humor? Well, um, <laughs> I don't know how to say this diplomatic, but uh, we used to have a saying, that the president had, had I, I don't know how to say this, his sense of humor, or as long as he was playing pranks on you, it was all right, but you know, you you don't uh, pull no snuts on him. But we, I, I got the same for that, but I don't think it's appropriate to say, say it uh, in this interview. It, it, it wouldn't be any worse than some of the things Califano was set on tape. Well, what uh, uh, we used to say, you had bo bad personality. You know, they say as long as the bad pushing you around, as long as you don't push him back, you know, it, it, in good, that's the way it should be. But if you push the bad back, he get mad at you. And, and, <laughs> and uh, so that we used to say, cut it off that way. But he did have a sense of humor, of course, not being on the same status, I, I wasn't equal. You 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 wouldn't contest it about uh, 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 anyway. So uh, he did have a good sense of humor. I, I, I admit that. I remember one time uh, uh, he was swimming in the pool, and I was. He didn't like no debris to be in the water when he was was in the pool. So I was skimming, there's a few leaves was in the pool and I would take them out as they fall and walk around to keep the place pool clean. He said, Jane, he says, uh, you think ain't nobody watching you, but they are. He says, uh, oh, what time of morning did you get up and go to work? I said, eight o'clock. I said, because, I said, I get up at eight o'clock and go to work. I said, but I don't eat breakfast or drink coffee, I just get up and go to work. And I use it sometimes, it'd be eight o'clock at night before I start with. He said, well, you keep this place clean. See, I just want you to know 
that you're doing a good job. And uh, I says, uh, no, when he first says, made that remark, I say, sir, what you say? He said, oh, hell, you heard me the first time. And he was right. I did hear him. But I wanted to see if he could say it again. And uh, him and Jesse Kellum used to sit around the table, and, and he, they would ask me a question. And I'd be a little evasive, you know, I wouldn't. And the president would say, to Mr. Kellum said, Jesse, did he answer, answer the, the question? He said, hell no, he didn't answer the question. <laughs> well, I was, if, if a person asked me a question out of, out of the blue, something run around my mind, I, what, what's, what's leading on here? And I become evasive, you know, I wouldn't come right out unless it pertains to the job. And he, Mr. President, used to say all the time, Ms. Johnson would be giving me instruction and telling me what to do. And he say, uh, Bird, say, it's going in one ear and right out the other. A lot of it was. But I mean, if it's appropriate and I knew it was necessary, well, I'd take action. But I mean, you know, you had to uh, say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, regardless. And and sometimes it, you'd say, well, I, that, I, you know, I, for respect, you always did say, yes, ma'am, or no, ma'am, but a lot of time, like he said, he was right. Now, he could figure it out, figure you out right away. Well, he would say a lot of times that uh, I was just just letting it go in when I right at the end. Uh, but uh, Ms. Johnson was one of the finest persons. In fact, the Johnson was the finest people. They would work for, I worked for a private home here in Austin. And the man never talked politics, and he never knew whether I was a Democrat or Republican. But uh, Lennon would want to, you to know, and uh, he had radios, TV, he had TV in the kitchen so that everybody could watch the news, know what was going on. And he was right. The more you know about uh, uh, the news, the politics, the better decisions you can make when it comes down to voting. Uh, I imagine there's a lot of things that I've, I could mention. Uh, like I say, since I had my head injury, you know, I, I, I don't, some of the stuff, if somebody reminds me about it, well, I can remember and discuss it. Mm. On November 22nd, 63, I know uh, uh, when President Kennedy was assassinated, uh, they were supposed to come to the ranch. Were, mm. were you working at the ranch at that time? Precisely. I was watching TV when the, 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 when he was in Dallas, and the motorcade were on TV, and we were standing in the kitchen watching it. We had, uh, uh, Kenny had been to the ranch, uh, the uh, president-elect, but he hadn't been there as president. And uh, he liked pecan pie, and we, the cooks was, was cooking, cook, Con pie, and we had everything all set up for the president when he come to the ranch. But we, you know, the story he never didn't make it to the ranch. Yeah. Who were some of the most interesting people you met over the years? Well, uh, mm, I thought even though Senator, I thought Senator Russell's one of I tell you, one person that I had met, I didn't take on to too good, cause he wasn't in the president cabinet. That was uh, uh what's his name? Uh, hmm. Henry Kissinger. I, I I didn't. Me and him didn't have the same vibes, but most of everybody that the president invited to the ranch was. Somewhat, we all accept as, as our friend and friend of the president and friend of this country. But uh, I'm not trying to put him down, but he he didn't uh, accept people uh, that were in my category. He didn't seem to 
there was nothing. I mean, you know what I'm trying to say. But uh, uh, most of everybody, even Kennedy's brothers, came there. I don't think he'd ever hunted a day in his life because the first time he shot the deer, the gun uh, uh, caliber up and hit him in the hit him in the face, and he had a, a bruise from shooting shooting sh shoot, shooting the deer. He did hit the deer, but he he got he had never hunted before, and then, and the president think everybody could hunt and could uh, ranch and everything else, but everybody he brought they. they Put him in the car and take him, show him the ranch. And if it's hunting season, they they hunting. And we used to have a, a we used to, what's the name of this place? They sold it over the lake. Lake uh, we used to go to the lake all the time, at least once a week when he was home. We used to go over there and he used to go riding, boating. You know, go boat riding. And uh, and we used to have a at a place called they named it Mayor Margaret. They eventually gave it to Mayor Margaret. You know that Mayor Margaret was one of his secretaries, and he had a lake place over the, over there. And eventually, he they gave the name the house Mayor Margaret. And eventually, I think he gave it to him, but he finally got rid of it. But. Uh, you were there when um, Chancellor Earhart came down to the ranch? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Chancellor, I was there. Uh, he, I liked him very much. I had forgot about that that you mentioned. Yeah, I remember Chancellor Earhart. We really enjoyed him being at the ranch. Uh, let me think. They had a lot of press out there then, I guess. Oh, yeah. Oh, you bet there's a lot of press all over the place. But we stayed out the way of the press. <laughs> I remember when the press moved moved out there. The press wanted to interview us, but Mr. Keller, me, kind of got the press going. So we we never got into trouble. But got into trouble by something when the press, some press guy would ask you, and you'd call yourself answer and put your foot in your mouth. We never had none of that kind of stuff going on. Uh, he was a hard worker, wasn't he? Who was that? The uh, president. The president. Oh, you bet he was a hard worker. And he expect for if you work for him to be a hard worker. And I think that's why some of the uh, pre bad press was that uh, some people thought he was too hard because he worked hard. He expect for everybody else to work hard. I remember the longest, uh, the longest day, work day for me in my life was uh, 22 hours. Uh, we went hunting, got up at four o'clock, and went hunting that morning. And uh, I forgot who the guests were, but anyway, and we parted till, till I uh, went hunting at six o'clock. Parted till two o'clock. I had to get up. Another two hours ago hunting, and guess what he said? He said, James, say, I mean, uh, 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 he told, he said, James, say, you and Gene, y'all can go hunting today. <coughs> Who, after we had been in the woods all day and taken out about six, seven deer, and we had to take them to John City, you know, for the process, and you know, well, he really stopped me from hunting because, I mean, you know, they would hunt every day, and, and me and myself and Gene, who, uh, Jockey, who would have to take, you know, got to get and take it to, to Johnson City, or the processing plant. Anyway, the longest day, um, the work day of my life was 22 hours. Never up, I was up 22 hours. But, and that's the day that, that's one day he didn't go hunting. He, he decided he wasn't going to hunt. I think it got the best of him, too. But uh, we did a lot of hunting, a lot of deer hunting, and a lot of, and I used to, a lot of, a lot of times, 
I, like I said in the beginning, I used to help the ranch farmer uh, uh, move irrigation pipes and and help them round. You know, they have to round up the cows and I help them uh, vaccinate the cows and and. It used to do, we used to do that in January, around January, February, because and and uh, so I got my experience. I did every. I tell everybody I did everything at the ranch, but fly the plane. And I see Dale Meeks was 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 gonna give me some points on that, but uh, I uh, what happened? Dale quit or got married or something? Anyway, I didn't get to fly the plane, but I did everything on the range but fly the plane. He was a hard man to work for, but he was a very thoughtful man too, wasn't he? Yeah. Well, I didn't find him hard to work. I just found I found that uh, people wanted to work and socialize, and Lennon wants you to work. And he socialized with you when he wanted to socialize, but he wanted people to do. It. I never had no problem. I mean, it was a lot of hard work, but uh, I find that. that that uh, if work did proportionally, it it helps you to live longer. You know, uh, I'm I'm around here 82 years now. It, it didn't bother me. The hard work didn't bother me. It's not be, being a, I imagine not being able to to have a job and would bother me more than having a job that required me to work hard. But, uh, he was a very fair person, and I found out through my own observation that uh, he, while he should have been sentimental and, and uh, civil rights, is that uh, when he finished college, he was he went to South Texas to taught school, and he was teaching school with kids walking around in the wintertime with no shoes, and uh, I remember one time he he, he mentioned that uh, uh, if you give one of those kids a nickel, he turned around he went and got all his buddies so they can get a nickel too. But uh, I think that he really did get his schooling of poverty when he was teaching school uh, in South Texas because he I heard him say several times that. Those people sure had a hard time. They didn't have nothing. And and I think in the back of his mind, that was there when the time come for the, the, the action he taken on civil rights. He never forgot it. No, never forgot it. Once you've been exposed to something, you can put it back on the back burner, but eventually something will come around and it, it expose itself to you again. Uh, and uh, one other th thing I forgot to mention, that during uh, January and February, the middle of February, uh, we had another employee by the name of Loopy Bravo. Me and him used to do all the pruning of the trees uh, during that time. You know, it was a slow time, so we did all the pruning of the trees in the arch, uh, you know, on the river, on the uh, uh, the banks of the of the Pudding Alice. I mean, this this fella, a friend of mine, we used to do all the pruning of the trees at that time, and uh, we kept him in pretty good shape. And up uh, and Miss uh, Bailey, his cousin Oreo, everybody called that was his cousin, and uh, that's why the, I forgot about the practice he used to pull on me between me and. Uh, uh, Miss Bailey, called the Oreo, they call her, Oreo Bailey. He would catch it going and tell me to go up and clean a house. And I'd go up there and clean the house, and and uh, she would uh, go up Stonewall and tell everybody, say, say, James Davis up there taking all my stuff out of my house. And uh, let him to get a kick out of it, because when he, the people tell him he knew I wasn't taking anything, I'd just go up there and, and clean it. 
and uh, uh, they would give, someone would give her, uh, constantly giving her stuff that she would throw under the bed or, or throw it places, then she'd come along, couldn't, didn't see it, couldn't find it, she'd say somebody had taken it. But Conorio used to, uh, uh, she used to drive on and go to Stonewall, and she was an old lady, and she had several wrecks running, and uh, she eventually, they stopped her from driving, but uh, uh, he used to get a kick out of her complaining about me taking her stuff. And uh, he would give her a quart of whiskey every Christmas. And when she passed, she had all, they, her, co her relatives come up to, you know, to clean up the place and, and, and distribute the furniture. To how, how, who never wanted this and wanted that? But anyway, they found about two cases of whiskey under her bed. And, you know, she didn't drink it. She just, she'd take it. They, you know, they give it to her. She'd take it home and put it under the bed. And accuse people of taking it in that world when... Mm. And she used to understand. Uh, she, she would uh, listen to to KDBC, and and would they would compensate a little. She'd report that to him that some of the programs she liked and what they didn't do and all that. And it, it was a scheme, I guess, to keep her busy. But uh, she that was one of the jobs that she had was to monitor the TV station and radio station. I remember she used to drive that car like a bat out of hell. Oh, yeah, that's right. She, She'd hit that cattle guard. Yeah, she, she, was, she, she was pretty rough with the car. But uh, uh, a lot of stories about her cutting over the in the car, I, I, I don't, can't put my hand on a lot of it, but I do know that she would often run into people. She didn't never hurt nobody, but, I mean, she run run into people and... And, uh, but they kept her happy. The president kept her ha pretty happy. Uh, I didn't uh, elaborate on, we used to put up peaches from the time the garden was, in, was, was producing vegetables. We would be busy until about August the 1st. And uh, we be we now would put up about a, a hundred quarts of peaches and about a hundred quarts. I mean, in the freezer. I ain't talking about the preserves themselves. We put up a 70, 75, 80 uh, um, uh, boxes of of, of of peaches for him to give away. But and we'd put up. Corn, we put up 50 bags of peas and about, I don't know how many bags of corn in a quart size, put them in the deep freeze. We had a couple of deep freeze that we put all this stuff in. And we'd be finished with the garden about the 1st of August. But then we would take our vacation from August the 1st until about the 15th. Then we'd come back. At that time, uh, we'd go down and gather pears from... Uh, Cutting she had a couple of pear trees. We'd go down together, and then that's when we'd put up the, the pears because they'd come in, come along in, in late August or around the first of September. But all year long, we was busy doing that. And by the time we get the pears put up, then it'd be time for hunting season. And that's when the president would come. They, we was busy all all year long. We had something to do. The first we, uh, my first experience, now the first year over there. Uh, they they used to have uh, uh, people to come out and prune the trees, but after a few years after I was there, and me and Lupe, then we took over that responsibility. So all year long we had something to do. The first of the year we do the uh, um, pruning of the trees, and then come along planting the garden and. The uh, and when, also in the garden we had flowers. We, we planted cut flowers in the garden for the for the house, 
When I first went there, we would plant them in the yard, but it was too, it didn't have enough space to plant, cut flowers in the yard, so we had a space in the, in, in, in the garden for the cut flowers also. Well then, in the spring, we started doing the garden. By the time we get the garden, while well, we had get it all situated and it start producing, then we just start put uh, picking and putting up stuff constantly until uh, August, around August. Then we have everything put up, the peaches and all, because the peaches was in intertwined with putting up the, when we weren't putting up peaches, we was putting up uh, vegetables. And then when August look, we'd have everything done around August 1st. That's when we would take our vacation. And I so planned it that way for 42 years, 41 years, I, my vacation always started on August 1st because my birthday was on August 12th. So I, I, wouldn't mean, I wouldn't have to make an excuse that I, I had a birthday because it always f would fall in that between the slack time. Uh, and until right now, I, I usually take my vacation in August. I don't think anybody has told the story of uh, how he went into the egg business after he left office. Well, now I was mixed up in that, but uh, I didn't make a good mental note of that. He, he, and why we uh, kept the chickens and raised the eggs. I used to, used to put up eggs by the uh, a crate of eggs, I think it's 36 dozen. Anyway, we used to, uh, I was responsible for, for feeding the chicken and gathering the egg, me and Jock and Wade, for Jock picking, uh, I mean, gathering the eggs and, and washing them and, and putting them in the crate and send them to KDBC. I, I, now, I don't know the whole story. All we do is get the eggs together and send them over there. I didn't know how, they did, how, how he got rid of them. But anyway, I know we used to send crates, crates of eggs to, and they'd take them to KTBC at that time. We'll get Cactus to tell us how they, what, what they did with them when they got up to KTBC. Yeah, yeah, Cactus, he, he, he was there when the beginning and then I, I guess he'd be there till the end. I was, uh, I had a, someone give me a tape of the Brown Building and Cactus, I didn't know that they started KTBC and the Brown, Brown Building. Uh, and anyway, Cactus was just a youngster when he started broadcasting. And it's fascinating all the stories that they would tell about and the, the story was about the Brown Building and how London and, and all the people met over there and, and went on. But uh, uh, Cactus would know and he seemed to have a bit, he keep that stuff pretty well. Well, you've been terrific. Well, I I guess ten years ago it would have been better because uh, I wouldn't, you know. Uh, like I see, I had this head injury, and then uh, you know, I don't retain stuff like I used to. You would never. Well, I, don't, I don't think any of us. <laughs> 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 the older we get. Well, I hope I've been the 